I was at RPI and all of my friends were in the arts department. So the arts department, just like at CMU, I've watched here, you can, they have all of these cameras and projectors and stuff. And as a student, you'd be like, I'm working on a project and I need access to these. So we would, my friends and I, we were, one of my friends had a local like Tuesday DJ night in this dive bar downtown that was across the street from where they lived. And we just started doing visuals there. We plugged into the TVs at the bar and then we started taking out equipment from the equipment room and bringing it down there. And then eventually like the professors who were in the arts department became part of that scene as well. So they were doing weird performances and letting us take out way too much equipment from the equipment room. Uh, and even at some point, like my roommates and I, we had our, you know, we were off campus and we threw a house party. Welcome to another episode of Tech in the Arts, a podcast series of the Arts Management and Technology Laboratory. The goal of our podcast series is to exchange ideas, bring awareness, and stay on top of the trends. You're listening to our Art and Code podcast series, highlighting artists working at the intersection of performance, real-time visuals, and live coding. This series is in partnership with the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry at Carnegie Mellon University. My name is Hannah Brainerd, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the lead researcher for Amped Lab. Today, I'm joined by David Lublin, a video artist, programmer, and performer based in Brooklyn, New York. He's the co-owner of a software company called Vidbox that makes tools for fellow video artists. Um, some of the blog posts are really just interesting work. I'll admit that I didn't know the term VJ before I started looking into your this, background. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I knew what that was, but I didn't know it was this whole thing, this whole field. So that's uh, It's similar to uh, the way that, like... There was this period where like DJing was mm -hmm. just like you're you play ra records on the radio right. and then it became this whole other thing and VJing is kind of unknown because it went through this phase where it was like you had your MTV VJs who just showed music videos and then there was this whole section of people who were like no no we're similar to like the performing DJs and we do live video stuff um, but the term didn't really pick up and there were people who really who were in that scene who hated the term VJ. <laughs> because uh, they didn't want to be associated with this MTV thing. So they would come up with other terms like, uh, I'm, a, I'm a video instrumentalist or a visualist, whatever kind of high art that they come up with that kind of applied to them. Is there a term that you prefer? Uh, I just go with VJ, it's okay. fine. <laughs> I, I think now that we've, now that MTV doesn't actually play music videos anymore, uh, I think the community has captured that term. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I'll just go ahead and dive into some of the questions here. So looking at your bio, I loved this line. You described yourself as an artist, programmer, performer, and occasional mathematician. Could you tell me a little bit more about what that means and how some of these interests come together in your work? Sure. Uh, well, when I was growing up, I was always a math nerd. Um, when I was in high school, I was on the math team uh, and took like an, every semester I had this extra math course. But when I went into college, I for some reason went into electrical engineering and computer system engineering, which I hated. And my senior year, I switched to being a full math major. Uh, and so math has always kind of been, I don't know, I guess in my blood a little bit, or my brain, or my heart. Uh, but I'm not a very good mathematician. I have friends who have like full on PhDs and they've done brilliant math things. And uh, I consider myself an occasional mathematician because sometimes in the course of uh, writing software, uh, I guess at this point, computer software design has evolved into like multiple different, it used to be this period where you go study computer science and it covers everything that you have to do with making software. And now there's interface design, there's backend stuff, and then there's making algorithms for actual processing of things. So most of the time I have to just do interface design or backend building, but every once in a while I get to sit down and write an algorithm. Mm -hmm. And that is a very different programming process, even though that's what it ends up as, it ends up as code, but it starts as, I need to do some math, maybe on paper, and figure out what's going on, and then adapt it into a code that gets optimized and things like that. Gotcha. Does that come in handy with your artistic work at all? Uh, it, it does at times. Um, probably one of my favorite like one-off performances that I've done before was kind of, uh, it was you know totally made up art stuff, uh, like a little reality that I had made, but the presentation of it was like bar graphs and um, 
other kind of data visualizations of made up completely made up data that was itself audio reactive and it was used for like a live performance. So the, the performance itself was these animated graphs that were changing over time okay. uh, along with the music. That's interesting. That's really cool. Yeah. Unfortunately, I, I did that performance like once and then just <laughs> never redid it again. Yeah. So just diving in a little bit more into your background, how you got started in all of this. Um, I read that you started mixing video at a local bar using video mixers, VCRs, cameras, and projectors. Um, I imagine some of the technology that you use has changed over the years. Um, so what are some of the software and hardware changes um, that you've seen? It's interesting. So yeah, the background there was I was at RPI, and all of my friends were in the arts department. So the arts department, just like at CMU, I've watched here, you can, they have all of these cameras and projectors and stuff. And as a student, you'd be like, I'm working on a project and I need access to these. So we would, my friends and I, we were, one of my friends had a local like Tuesday DJ night in this dive bar downtown that was across the street from where they lived. And we just started doing visuals there. We plugged into the TVs at the bar and then we started taking out equipment from the equipment room and bringing it down there. And then eventually like the professors who were in the arts department became part of that scene as well. So they were doing weird performances and letting us take out way too much equipment from the equipment room. Uh, and even at some point, like my roommates and I, we had our, you know, we were off campus and we threw a house party and we like made a list of like, this is the equipment we want, like four projectors and we want uh, these like lipstick cameras and all this gear. And we brought it down to the equipment room. They were like, why do you need this? And we were like, well, we're throwing a party. And they were like, we can't just give you this stuff for a party. And my, uh, my roommate who was my, uh, one of my former business partners and uh, collaborators artistically and uh, still work on projects together. She basically made like a floor plan of our entire apartment, listed out where all of the gear was getting used. We're like, oh, we're going to take these lipstick cams and we're going to like strap them to the arms of the DJ and those are going to go up onto the ceiling, you know, projections. And like, we had, so we have this and they were like, okay, here's the equipment. This is this is what you guys are learning to do. This is what your crew is learning to do. So it's a project, not a party. It's a project, <laughs> not a party. Right. It's a project party. <laughs> Even though it wasn't for a class or anything like that, it was just so that, that's kind of how we got our start. But uh, to get to your actual question of how the technology has changed, the biggest change has been from things moving from analog to digital. We were using analog video mixers. Uh, we loved the Panasonic WJMX30 and the WJMX50. Yeah, just these with like, they had like uh, some pre-baked, very simple effects, invert, strobe, like blur and sharpen kind of things. But you can, they were on knobs, you could just turn them. There was a giant crossfader for switching between your layers. Um, and then there's a bunch of video inputs on the back. Uh, and now there are digital video mixers and they do a lot of the very similar things. Um, so in that regard, video mixers, yeah, come and go. They just have changed in that way. And same thing with like capture devices that we were using at that time, computers were like just at the point where they could start doing real-time visuals. We were working at like standard definition, essentially 640 by 480 if we were lucky. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's really just improved there is just computers can now do way more pixels, and I can, you know, all of the technical limitations where I was like, oh, I can, I would need to set up two computers and have them going into a video mixer so I could get what I wanted. And now everything can be done in one computer. Uh, but I still often think back to that set up and if I can, I still have two computers and a video mixer because I want that extra backup or mm -hmm. there's always some other use for it if I don't want to, you know, on the occasions where I can pack more. But it's nice when you want to pack light, you can just do everything on a laptop. Gotcha. So that kind of leads into some of your professional work with Vidvox and VDMX. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the company, um, some of the features that it offers, um, and how being an artist has sort of helped you in that field? Yeah. So the company was originally founded by this guy, Johnny DeCam, in the late 90s. My friend and I took over the company from Johnny at a certain point, probably like 2004. And so Johnny had really came up with the idea for VDMX, and then we kind of took it more to the next level. He was, yeah, uh, kind of limited what he could do as a programmer, brilliant artist, uh, great interface designer, but limited in terms of what his programming skills were. And he kind of passed it off to us, and we kind of took it a little bit further. We got into it, though, because we were doing all of these live performances. We were writing our own little tools. Every, we were trying to, like every other week, make our a different performance that was totally different. And we were working in Max MSP at the time, usually when we were writing our own software. And yeah, VDMX kind of came became the evolution of that because Max was great, but we had to 
it was still programming, and you still had to do, it had built up a lot of infrastructure before you could get to something that you liked, and what you could do with the interface was limited uh, in certain ways. So yeah, VDMX kind of evolved from that. It was like, OK, we need a tool that's higher level than a programming language, but not so dumbed down that it's this fixed tool that is just for these cookie cutter kind of performances. And yeah, that's kind of how VDMX evolved. So it's, I usually describe it as like Photoshop for real time video because you're still working with layers and groups of layers and composition modes of different blend modes, and you're putting effects on things. But instead of it being you apply an effect and it's just rendered onto your pixels just once and you see the output, it's a stream of stream going through every layer and all of your effects have real time parameters that you can adjust. Uh, we also have, you know, there's uh, audio analysis that so you can make things audio reactive. Uh, there's all kinds of ways of creating control data that automate your different parameters. You can set up uh, cues if you want to have like something that's more of a structured performance that just you kind of hit play on. And yeah, it's kind of one of like several tools in our field. And what what I like about uh, the field of real time video. And this is very similar to what I've noticed with music. And a friend of mine, I'm kind of borrowing this from a friend of mine who's a teacher, a music teacher. He was describing to his new students that for them, his goal was to teach them lots of different tools and lots of different techniques. And it was up to them to see which techniques and tools they liked and combine them all to create their own unique style. And, equate it, and I equate it to if you're a painter, and you were limited to using uh, canvas from one company and only their paintbrushes, you're very limited because, you know, you as a mixed, particularly mixed media artist, you want to try out all of these different tools, the best combinations of them for you and your style, and that's really important in kind of all fields of art. It seems like. Right. So in some ways, it's like helped you create the art that you're interested in creating, and you're able to pass that on to other artists um, to take on in their, their own ways. Yeah, and, and still recognizing that they're going to use other tools. So uh, interoperability is very important for us. Right. So speaking of some other tools, there's a lot of technology that's buzzing in the mainstream right now. Um, AR, VR, AI, all sorts of things. How do you see that fitting into the world of um, video instrumentalism or VJing? <laughs> And what are you excited about? What are you skeptical about um, in that field? So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot coming. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to virtual reality and AR stuff and XR stuff, there's a lot of potential there. When I was teaching VJing, one of the assignments for the class was you have to create a music video and using real-time techniques where you kind of record your output in the way that like a musician will do studio sessions and then somebody will take them and edit them together. And the biggest part of what I was te trying to teach them there was that when you're performing live visuals, everything around you is very immersive. There's big projections, the music is very loud, and it's kind of, it's a very different experience than when you're watching a music video on a television screen and the person can kind of just get up and walk away. Right. So you have to be far more engaging. And with AR and VR, I think there's a lot of opportunities for people who are visual artists to create these worlds that are even more immersive, mm -hmm. uh, these experiences that are even more immersive uh, and engaging in, in that sort of a way, something that somebody's not just going to get up and walk away from uh, if it you know, doesn't have the right pacing or feels a little bit awkward. Mm -hmm. And it also kind of, I think there's not just the personal experience of it, but the shared experience of it, mm -hmm. not just even in a single space, but it allows for this interconnectedness of performance that are spread out distributed, mm -hmm. not just in a, you know, a concert hall or something like that. Mm -hmm. I also know somebody who uh, runs a planetarium in New York for like a, a well, used to run a planetarium, is now designing a new planetarium, and has been trying to think about like, they, they used to do also live performances on the dome as part of okay. what they wow. can do in the planetarium. <laughs> so they've been talking about how they can use uh, AR as part to enhance the experience of their planetarium so that people who are there can get kind of a personalized experience on top of the dome itself. Mm -hmm. So I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities there. When it comes to like artificial intelligence and machine learning, there's a lot more in terms of like the ethical concerns of what's going on there, uh, in particular like intellectual property. So there, I there's so many to comment on there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> what I'll talk about there is I did a project maybe seven or eight years ago, 2006ish or 2016ish rather. Uh, it was called TV Helper, and it was a uh, use a very like 
rudimentary machine learning toolkit that those that company got bought by Google and they work on much bigger things now. But at the time they had this free open source uh, little, you know, you give it an image and it gives you back kind of image net results of like, here's what we think we see in the image, but really not great because it was 2016 and those things have come a long way. Mm-hmm. Pretty good for that time and free and, and, and most importantly, it was fast. Right. So I made a toolkit that watched live television and let you as the user pick what style you wanted the subtitles to be converted into. So it would watch television and you would turn up, like a, it would have like a MIDI controller like this where you'd have like, this slider would be for Western style, and this one would be for the style of the State of the Union, and this one was the style of comedy. And I pretty much like went and had a thing that parsed uh, like television scripts. I just, in the way that ethically people are scraping things off of the internet, I scraped, ethically or unethically, mm-hmm. I scraped a whole bunch of scripts off of, you know, some website that had television scripts on it mm-hmm. and loaded them into some algorithm that I made and connected that to a thing. So you could watch television. Um, but every once in a while, it would say things that were just, like, inappropriate mm-hmm. or the juxtaposition of what it was watching were bad. Mm-hmm. And I never found, like, a good way to have a system that self-moderated itself. I know that pe- that's a big part of what people do when they're building machine learning systems. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day for this, there was no way that I could conceive of a machine understanding the co- all of the context behind who these celebrities might be on or what the situation was. So I, I went to a, a conference called Bot Summit and people were talking about how they made these Twitter bots and they would wake up every morning and they had created all of this artwork for them. Mm-hmm. It was just post, mm-hmm. you know, out, every hour you got this image that it generated and they were great. And every morning for me, it was, I had to wake up and moderate my Twitter feed for my bot because it may have said something horrible. I may have left it watching the news and it made fun of a car accident or something like that. So my morning started off with deleting all of the things that were not great for my bot. Mm-hmm. And so I've, I think that at the end of the day, I, there should almost always be a human involved in the chain mm-hmm. of that of creation and moderation at the end. I don't fully trust this, but right. yeah. But I, I do think that there are going to be some amazing art projects that come out of it from the people who do care about it um, in the right way. And I, I'm seeing people using the generative tools to create amazing things that they're using in VJ software already. Mm-hmm. And some of the kind of more simple algorithms are going to be very useful. We're looking into like using some of the background removal stuff because that you can do real time now. And rather than having to use the green screen or something like that, you can just use the same algorithm that Apple you know, has for your iPhone. You can just drag somebody out of an image now. And you can use that. It works near real time. So we're, we're looking into adding some of that stuff where it's uh, kind of like a moving piece in a larger project that you might do. Right. So a tool to assist in the creation process, not a replacement of the, the human aspect. Yeah, yeah. I, I like the term uh, assisted intelligence as opposed mm-hmm. to, or augmented intelligence yeah. as opposed to artificial intelligence. I like that. So just to conclude my last question for you, could you tell us a little bit about some of your recent projects or other projects that you've seen that you're really excited about? Since the pandemic, I have not had, a, I feel like all my creativity has drawn out of my body. Uh, these days I, get most of my kicks out of a friend will have a project and they'll be like, can you help with this last 5% on a thing? And I'll be like, yes, I would love to not have to think creatively. I can just come in and help with some technical aspect or give you some advice and you're just going to direct me on what you want me to do. And, and so I've been really enjoying that. I have a f- One of my good friends has been really getting into um, doing analog synthesizers and making their own of those. So I think that'll kind of maybe be my next leap of their, all of my friends who are in that area are like, hey, you should get, you know, make your own Euro rack and analog synthesizer stuff and then start doing, make some video modules for that. I'm like, okay, maybe we'll, maybe after I get like the current, uh, we're, Fitbox wise, we're just working on our next major release, which is a not particularly exciting update because it's mostly just switching from legacy OpenGL code to metal code, which a lot of companies are in the position of having to do now. And it's... Uh, not not very exciting to talk about. <laughs> uh, we're just at the point where we're like optimizing stuff. It's uh, getting back to like how has technology changed? Mm-hmm. More than the divide from analog to digital, it's that even developing software, you have to do all of this m- maintenance year after year of just mm-hmm. keeping up to date with the latest technologies, even when you're not adding new functionality sometimes. But this is, a, I guess that's exciting for us because once we get that over that hump to, the, to being in metal and Vulkan, 
we can take advantage of all of that stuff. So all of the stuff that Apple now provides in the vision libraries will be easier for us to access. So that's like over the horizon for us, but we still have to deal with a lot of technical debt right now, which is not that something that they sense. teach you about so much when you're uh, learning in college. <laughs> we don't teach you about the amount of technical debt that you take on or that when you go to work for another company and they're like, you're really excited to work on something new and they're like, well, we have all this technical debt. We have all this stuff that's fixed in place and needs to be updated or maintained. Right. And it's not, not <laughs> sexy work at all. <laughs> you're like, I thought this was going to be fun and yeah. exciting and break. And all that's coming. Yeah, <laughs> as, right. As soon as the, yeah. But uh, I, when I see my friends who are doing analog synthesizer stuff, it really reminds me of the early earlier days where we were just plugging stuff in and having a really good time just messing around and making weird sounds and video. Right. So kind of a, a step back. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a step in another direction yeah. for a little while, but yeah. there's enough overlap where it fits for me. Yeah. That's great. Are there any other projects that you're excited about in the field? or? Not at yeah. the moment, <laughs> no. Yeah. I wish there were, but... I, <laughs> Uh, we w I was talking with somebody else yesterday about how it seems like there'll be maybe fads or like periods. So there was this period where like everyone was doing projection mapping for a while. That was the big thing. And, and now it's become kind of this uh, like solved problem. People know how to do projection mapping and all of the big projection mapping problem uh, projects that were like just done for vanity have really dried up. People aren't doing those as, okay. as often. And now it seems like the next role of it is going to be AI and ML stuff and the it's just kind of coming off the tip. But again, those things aren't quite at the point where they can do fully real-time stuff, so it hasn't really made it into the live visual scene totally yet. Gotcha. So something to look out for. Yeah. <laughs> I think in the next year or two, you'll start, things are getting there okay. on that level. That's great. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks for being at CMU for My this pleasure. program. This is, this is really exciting. Thank, thank you for the wonderful interview. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Art and Code series on Tech and the Arts. Be on the lookout for new episodes coming to you very soon. If you found this episode informative, educational, or inspirational, be sure to send this to another arts or technology aficionado in your life. You can let us know what you think of this podcast by visiting our website, amptlab.org, that's amt-lab.org, or you can email us at amptlabcmu at gmail.com. Follow us on Instagram at Tech in the Arts or Facebook and LinkedIn at Arts Management and Technology Lab. We'll see you next time.